Good evening, Larry. Well, hello, Andy. How's it going tonight? It's just going great. It's the best day of the rest of my life. Have you uh, taken a trip over to that bridge yet? I have not visited that bridge, but I've seen many pictures of it, and it does appear very persuasive. It, it appears persuasive? It's 600 feet? Yes, it, it appears that, that anybody who would uh, take a, a, a unexpected uh, drop from that would not survive. So it would be sufficient and efficient at um, eradicating breath from your lungs. Yes, the Rio Grande Gorge Bridge, for those who don't know, is is notorious for having no survivors for the people that have gone over the sides. <laughs> Even the Golden Gate can't claim such an honor. It has had one or two survivors. But that drops you off underwater. Yeah, water is quite a bit softer than, than uh, bedrock. No doubt, no doubt. Unless you land the oh, right way. If you land on your yeah. back, jumping that far, it, the, the water would, would destroy oh. you. I was going to say water is very hard when you're coming down from a great height. But if you went, how, how you land? Yeah. I don't, I don't know the physics behind it, but it seems that if you went like, kind of like a missile into the water, like your toes stretched out and and held your nose and your private parts, I, I don't know. It seems like you would make it in. Seems well, like it. I'm not going to try it though. Anybody want to write in say, and tell us? I, would, <laughs> uh, I don't think anybody's listening has probably had that experience to know. I don't think so. Please consider making us part of your podcast diet. You can find us at Registry Matters on your smart speaker or podcast app of choice like Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. Also, if you like what you hear, please write a review. If you don't forget everything I just said, you can support us at patreon.com slash registry matters. Well, you said that, but how do our listeners uh, receive notifications about new episodes? I'm glad you asked. Um, so on the website, there is a little box on the left side below some of the other icons. Click over there. So you're going to go to registrymatters.co and you can click there. And when a new episode is released, you will get an email notification. And when do they get that notification? I usually release the episodes at 11 o'clock on Monday night. So you would have it that night and you would be able to pick it up first thing Tuesday morning. All righty. Well, that sounds that sounds good. I think I'm going to register to hear what we've talked about. That seems sort of nepotism-ish, incest-ish. <laughs> well, I need to know how horrible I sound. All right. That's enough of this. So from ColumbiaMissourian.com, extremely complex sex offender res- residency restrictions are challenging to enforce. This article goes over that all the different restrictions that have to be monitored, like in my state, if you got sentenced before 06 and then between 06 and 08, and then there's another batch, there's like four different levels. They've got to figure out all the various different compliance restrictions. So this article is covering some of those, uh, those, those discrepancies in how different people have to be treated. And in the article, Detective Tony Perkins says he spends 40 hours a week running offender registration and profiles. Four times a year, seven more defective, defectives. That might actually fit. Seven more detectives join him for door to door check ins. Four school officers also help out during the summer, but for the most part, it's just Detective Perkins. That's a lot of resources spent to run around and try and figure out who's living in the right place, uh, who's home by curfew time and whatever for what? Well, Andy, it keeps the community safe. According to the proponents, where do they, where do you think they get their information about the, the recidivism rate, the likelihood of reoffense, anything of that nature? They have the same, they have the same information we have. But as I've said on previous podcasts, uh, the, 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 one of the structural flaws in the registry in most of our states, uh, but it's in all of our states that it's a law enforcement function. If it was truly a regulatory scheme, it would, it would be handled by a regulatory agency. But the, the structural flaw in most of it is that it's handed off to an elected official. Sheriffs are elected 
uh, and if they don't call it a sheriff, they, they have something similar like a constable or something. Constable. But they, they're, they're, they hand these these functions off to to a person who's elected. And as long as the public believes it's keeping them safe, and they want their elected sheriff doing these things, it's very difficult for elected sheriff elected sheriff to push back. It, it it does happen from time to time. There was one in Oklahoma, I think, in the Tulsa area that had had the task of of, of monitoring registrants, and he spoke out publicly at the end of his career about how misguided the policies were. But they they do they do these um, monitoring all these restrictions, and it's gotten to the point where I I don't even know how in a metropolitan area seven detectives would be enough because you're also monitoring their their social media. Right. They not only have restrictions on where they can live and where they can be present, uh, they have they have extreme restrictions on 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 who they can contact with uh, have contact with on social media, and they, so there there's there's a there's a uh, it, it, depending on how stringently you're going to monitor your caseload, the caseload would be very small depending on how many t- uh, that would require a lot of detectives. The money comes from the taxpayers, who appear to be more than happy for it to be spent. To do something that does only one thing and that makes you feel good, right? But there's no evidence to show that it does anything to improve safety. We we get on the Halloween gig at Marcel about the same resources spent on traffic and being out with the kids on Halloween would probably save more than that mythical one because we can't even find any history of the mythical one, right? That was molested on Halloween. Sosin, uh, Sosin puts out an article. I, I don't know if they just regurgitate the same one, but I've read it a handful of years where they, at least like a day or two after, they call the newspaper articles the day after to see how many kids were killed in a hit and run accidents. And maybe it's 10 or something like that. And not a single kid was abducted by anything, anybody on the registry. So perhaps it makes just a teeny bit more sense to put out some traffic cops because you know that there's, I don't know, a hundred million kids running around collecting trick or treats. You do indeed know that, and we we know that. I can't specify say with specificity how many are killed, but there there are children hit every Halloween. But if it saves uh, only one, well, that that would be the argument that that should be made uh, in in terms of allocation of the resources. But the public feels good about the sex offender scare. I keep saying to chagrin of a lot of people that. They're reflecting us back. The officers, yes. the elected people are a reflection of us. When people start calling their elected sheriff and say, Madam Sheriff, Mr. Sheriff, if you continue to do this, it's going to be difficult to, re- to support your next reelection. Right. Because this is a total waste of resources. But I can assure you that very few calls like that go to the elected sheriffs. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you on it. It, it is not. It is not the politician's fault for who they are. It is our fault for who they are. And that 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 uh, discombobulates and, and frustrates uh, some of our listeners because they don't understand why we don't understand that the politicians are grandstanding. But grandstanding only works to a receptive audience. Right. You can go into the deep into the Bible country and start saying, I want a campaign to – uh, outlaw certain things about religious freedom and you don't get a lot of applause and you would not win an election. That only works if you campaign to people who are receptive to what you're hearing. So this grandstanding, as we refer to it, it's only grandstanding because it's connecting with you, the voter. Yeah, That's the only reason it's grandstanding. <laughs> and, the, and they get mad when we say that. If, if, you, if you're a liberal progressive and you go into the Panhandle of Texas, where they where oil is their big business, and you say, "I want to transition this country to alternative fuels, away from these dirty old generation sources." You just don't get a lot of applause. So that w- you could grandstand all you wanted to, but you wouldn't get any votes, right? <laughs> because that's not that would not be reflecting the will of that part of Texas. If you go into Austin, by the other hand, you you uh, on the other hand, you you would get a lot more receptivity to that message because Austin's a lot more liberal. A lot more progressive people in Austin around the college and university, and you would you would you would have the, some 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 identification with that message, but not in the Texas Panhandle, you wouldn't. And I'm I'm not picking on you in the Panhandle though, but just just drawing drawing an analogy. Right. This next article comes from TruthOut.org. Florida inmates 
demand wages and higher wages for labor while incarcerated. Mm -hmm. They went on strike. They placed some of those making the demands in solitary. I say that'll teach them. This is about fighting the fees that force prisoners to pay for their incarceration. This is insanity. Uh, how do you, how do you say, look, I'm not going to go to work and then they just take you off to, uh, solitary as a punishment for you not going to work to support the operations of the prison. There's no, if, if they're forcing you to work and you're not getting paid, how is that not slavery? Well, you could argue that it, that, that it's involuntary, uh, servitude, but when you're, when you're, when you're sent to prison, that's a component of your punishment. Often it's sentenced to 10 years of hard labor or whatever. Uh, and, and it's a political decision whether they want to pay inmates for their services. Uh, and, and I guess Florida would be one of those states that doesn't. This, I didn't read this article in its totality. Uh, uh did, did you get a chance to read over well, the Florida pay? Yeah, I mean, it's an, they're one of five states where prisoners receive no money for their work, forcing families to cough up money for food and necessities. Florida is also one of 43 states that charge the prisoners for their so-called, quote unquote, stay behind bars. I can't I didn't realize that it was 43 states that charged you to stick around. Well, I, I, I'm not sure what the status is on what, the, how much of that's collected. It, it, it's one of those things that sounds good to the to the voters when you say we're going to make them pay and we're going to make them pay, and the people that are costing us money are going to have to pay. Very little is actually collected. I'm but what sure. it does do, what it does do though, is it saddles people with a civil judgment, so it digs the hole deeper, or mm-hmm. for, for them to uh, to try to climb out of. You get out of prison and you get handed a bill for worth amount of money, and then they take a civil action against you for not paying it. You're judgment proof in most cases, but then you have that that judgment hanging over you, which a judgment looks bad. At that point, you combine the uh, 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 the felony with with a recent judgment. Our our country, Andy, has gone nuts when it comes to to this type of stuff to charge people. Uh, I uh, copays are very common for medical mm-hmm. care. I think we talked about that preparation for the show. Yes, uh, that 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 copays have become so prevalent. Which means that if a person legitimately needs to see seek medical care, they they end up owing money, and if they manage to convince someone to send them twenty five dollars, mm-hmm. then it's all been devoured by the couple of times they've been to the doctor and got a prescription. Then then they might say like for your you know in Georgia they do a Christmas package, then they'll do like a spring package, so you get a package of special goodies twice a year. Maybe if you're negative on the books, they won't allow you to get a package. I hadn't heard that one. I'm pretty sure I remember hearing that before I I left. Here's another good little quote. It says, in 1984, Michigan legislators approved a measure authorizing counties to charge prisoners up to $60 a day for housing and to file civil suits to retrieve the money. I saw that, and and it's it's, we did the same thing here in Albuquerque. Our mayor, the former mayor, Marty Chavez, tried the same kind of shenanigan when he was mayor and he didn't collect any money. The bureaucracy of attempting to collect it cost more than the actual revenue that was brought in and they finally dismantled the attempt to charge the county. I think it was $40 a day here, but whether it's 40 or 60, it really doesn't make any difference. Who can pay it? Right. That's actually a pretty steep cost. If it were, I don't even, I don't even want to really put a price tag on this, but Per, per, oh God, how how would you ever possibly do this other than to go to the other extreme and say that it is somehow a failure of society to, quote unquote, program you to live within it, within the boundaries that we establish to live productively together? Yes, certain people fall outside of that, but it feels to me that it would be on society to grow you the right way to work within it. If you fall outside of those, it is still on society to figure out a way to most appropriately reprogram you for when you are released. That's kind of radical thinking, Andy. You're 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 saying that you're almost implying that we benefit as a society if we try to recover the human being and 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 pr- produce a unit that's more functional. That sounds kind. Of, that kind of, sounds kind of uh, progressive, doesn't it? I I I'm trying. I, I think before I went. Before I left in 2008, I think I was on the other side. I was like, feed them bread and water, chain gangs. I, I, I was of that mindset. 
I had no empathy. I had no understanding of the destruction that goes on inside. And I personally feel that I'm unique in my ability to weather the storm and I didn't succumb to what they were doing in there. But if you're not of a self-motivated kind of mindset, uh, a, an autodidact would be a word of self-teaching yourself, then you're just going to succumb to your surroundings. And here you are strapped in a room with 80 other people that think the exact same way as you do. All you're going to do is learn how to throw dice and play parlay and watch BET or watch some, some sports on TV. That's all there is to do. How does that prepare you to come out and get a job, pay some rent, get some taxes and prepare for some sort of retirement and take care of your family members? How is that possible? But I don't think we've connected the dots with the public. I don't think the public realizes that every dysfunctional unit is a drain that could be potentially a production, a productive member and a contributing member. When I, t- I use the thing in, in, in my capital that if, if, if we, if we relegate people to second class status, their contributions into our tax systems that we depend on as older generations, when we have our paws out, to collect, there won't be anything there. We, we're a whole lot better off, but I don't think we've been able to connect the dots that they realize that. If you've got two million people incarcerated and all but a very slim number of them, and I'm talking about nation, nationwide, over yeah. 2.6, 2. I think, or 2.4 million people incarcerated, they're coming back to the streets someday. Are we better off as a nation with those 2.6 million people being better equipped to work and pay taxes? Or are we better office of society if they're pushing a shopping cart around with their hand out and contemplating criminality. And it doesn't take a lot of rocket science to figure out which way we're better off as a society. How much money can 2.6 million people living a productive life contribute? It Then it just feels like on the flip side, you've just said that they are a broken person and they deserve nothing further from society to get straight. That's our attitude that, that they should have gotten it growing up. There's a lot I, I hear from people who don't have any experience with, with, uh, with dealing with offenders that they had an opportunity growing up and they should have taken advantage of it. Right. Of yes, course they should have. They should have. They didn't. They didn't for a variety of reasons, uh, of, 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 of our so, a fail, a failure of our social, social uh, safety net. People do grow up in dysfunctional homes. They grow up in one parent homes. They grow up with people using substance. Uh, abusing substances. They grow up without anybody contributing to trying to help them become a good citizen. And and they grow up in, 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 in dysfunctional environments and they become more likely to be a dysfunctional unit themselves. But that's not to our advantage of society to say, well, all right, you had your chance. You had 18 years. We, we, we offered you 12 years of education. You didn't take advantage of it. You're, you're done. F you kick rocks, move on. But now you end up on the inside of the system. So where, like, where, where would be the next logical progression? If you have decided that you're going to wash your hands of them, what happens next? What happens next is what we have now, the revolving door, Andy. I, I mean, t- to me, it seems like it would be more efficient to then, if you're convicted of a crime, it's just a death sentence. We'll move to the judge dread model that, oh, psh, sorry. I, I, I consider you guilty and you're executed on the spot. I'm being incredibly extreme and almost tongue in cheek and just laughable. But as opposed to having the revolving door and spending all the money for it, why not just end it on the spot? Well, we have a little bit of a problem with uh, capital punishment is losing popularity and it's less and less used in this country. And, and, and I hope that I see in my lifetime the total eradication of capital punishment. I don't think that's a viable model. But we're relegating to them to something similar. If you go out and talk to homeless service providers, they will tell you that a large segment of the people they're dealing with who are chronically homeless is because of a criminal record. That's not the only component. Right. They're, they, 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 they're dealing with substance abuse. They're Mental dealing with issues. PTSD. But a significant number of them are former offenders who just cannot reintegrate into society. Let's move on. Yeah, well, I, I did notice that the that Illinois uh, legislature did pass a bill to repeal uh, pay to stay, and the governor vetoed it. Bruce Warner, I think, is, uh, he he did veto the attempt to repeal pay to pay to stay. 
so you can conclude that at least the, the majority of the Illinois Assembly gets the picture, but unfortunately they, they elected the wrong executive. Right, right. <laughs> hmm. All right, then. So what do you have for me there next? How can our listeners call in the show and ask questions or leave a comment? We have a lot of people out there who want to talk to us. And how do they do that? They're going to call in. Just pick up your phone, the old, what is it called? The most efficient form, the most inefficient form of communication and dial 747-227-4477. And we, we, we will play them on the air if they're good and audible. Uh, yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, this next article comes from myfox8.com. This could be Jorge, but I'm going to say it's George. George Porto Sierra accused of trying to burn several sex offenders to death at motel. Larry, <laughs> this asshole set a motel on fire that had people on the registry living in it. He broke a window to pour gasoline inside. When he was asked by the police why he didn't carry out his plans, he said, you guys got here too soon. Well, at <laughs> least he at least he was clear on his intentions. Um, he said, I'm going to kill you, child molester, as he uh, cracked the window. And uh, he was carrying a cigarette. And uh, he also was accused of pouring gasoline on a car, too. Because after you're dead, you sure as heck don't need your car anymore. Now, where did this happen at? Andy? This is in Florida. Um, Osceola? Osceola County, Florida? Os Osceola County, Florida, yes. So I that's, that's just awesome. It. That's just awesome. And this is totally an effect of there being a public registry. You could have been convicted of mooning somebody at a college football game or something like that, and you got yourself on the register. You could have been like the woman in Virginia and didn't report some sort of sex crime going on or sexual act going on between your kid and his girlfriend. And now you're on the registry. This guy pulls up the website, sees you on it, and says, oh, hell no, I'm not having that in my neighborhood, and goes and burns the joint down. We've had so much vigilantism through the years, uh, murders and attempted murders, and uh, uh, because of the public registry. I think the most notorious first earlier ones uh, was in Maine, but they've been in Washington, South Carolina, uh, and there's so many of them that we don't have the ability to directly connect to the registry because the law enforcement apparatus always proclaims unless the person does what this guy did and said, I'm doing it because of the registry. They always uh, proclaim that there's no direct connection that they can discern that the person just happened to be on the registry. But, but the, the proof is there that the registry is a platform that a tool that people use for vigilante acts. And I don't know what, what is the, the okay. The motel is probably uh, a, a lower end motel, right? Probably because most people that live in a hotel, motel setting, don't have gobs of money. They're they're looking for something that fits within the residence restriction, which is Florida is laden with. They have a state restriction, and the a local they have many localities that impose restrictions uh, greater than the state law. So he may have had these people that were living there may have had no option other than a rundown, lower dollar. Motel, and then a person says, "Oh, well, there's sex offenders here, so I'm going to burn the joint down to get rid of them." Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know where. What do they do? Uh, they're they're relegated to 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 living in a in a in a dive motel or the streets under the bridges. I think Miami Dade County was just kicking them out from under uh from their from their tent camps. Two hundred seventy five people living in a little tent compound. I don't I don't know what I don't know what happens next. They're going to burn them out or evict them. And yeah, like you were just saying, if they had $2,000 a month of disposable income to afford to live someplace, they're not picking the dive motel. They're not picking, they're not picking a hotel period. You could live in a different place more readily, uh, in a better environment and so forth, but they are kind of, that's like their last option. Generally it is the last option. And the people, when we talked about the dysfunctional people in society, the the low the low dollar hotels often is the last stop before the street. It's fair. They find a way find a way to to live at a at a at a rundown motel in an older seedier part of town, and and the urban renewal planners are 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 running those people out of business. And it and it it pains me as a progressive to to have this discussion because I recognize that 
I don't like people living in substandard conditions, but I've taken many polls in my day when I was in the housing business, and I've never found a person who preferred homelessness. <laughs> so the, 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 the facility may be substandard. It may not be ideal. And the, 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 the balancing act society has to do is to figure out what is too risky to have people living in these places because you're certainly living on the street has, is, is, is laden with risk. You've got the risk of the elements, the risk of the physical attacks, the risk of all sorts of uh, exploitation when you're on the street. You can't collect any sort of property because it's going to get stolen. And, and if you have substandard wiring or substandard heating, uh, if it's carbon monoxide asphyxiation as a possibility, you would want to close that unit down and close down that, that heat source. But even, even, even uh, uh, substandard uh, hotels, I've always found were preferable to the streets. And I, I, I always I urge caution when we're going to displace 100 people at a rundown hotel, just ask ourselves, where are they going to go? Yeah. What are we going to do next? And I've been doing a lot more activity on uh, Twitter lately. If you can follow us at Registry Matters on Twitter. And some guy, he took this guy's mugshot, this uh, Jorge or George Porto Sierra, and he captures a clip of his uh, uh, the, the article title of him being accused of burning the hotel. And he posts, what the guy do wrong? Now, how many likes did he get on Twitter, do you think? He would have gotten a lot more likes than dislikes. He got 250,000 likes. And how many dislikes did he get? It doesn't work that way. You just thumb something up. There's no thumb down on Twitter. There's no thumb down on Twitter. So I just, that's, I mean, that's, that's a lot of people to have exposure to see it from that one individual for them to chime in and say that they were in favor of his comment that way that, uh, I'm not saying anybody likes somebody that's a sex offender. There's just more to the story and people can be treated and people can move on and go to the next chapter. And I'm, if, if everyone wants to just throw them under the bus and eradicate them from the, the, the earth, well, then, then bring, bring back the firing squad. Cause there's 800,000 of us that you got to get rid of. Well, I'm going to take a little bit stronger stand. I, I find it uh, repugnant. It is 250,000 likes. Uh, uh, to, to, to say that what's wrong when someone's burning someone's home down yeah. at the risk of burning their, their innocent lives. Uh, that entire hotel wasn't occupied by people who had done anything wrong. Correct. Uh, to, uh, I, I just see that, that the fact that he got 250,000 likes shows that we've got 250,000 dysfunctional, misguided, Units out there that would that would do a thumbs up for a comment. Oh, uh, what did he do wrong? That that that's just mind boggling to me. It is spectacular, possibly deplorables. I would I would agree that that those two hundred fifty thousand would fit into a deplorable category. This article comes from jdsupra.com. Never heard of this one. Can you fire someone for being a sex offender? This article was talking about how when you have a job and they, I, I, let me, let me word it this way. In working a job, you and I are sitting there and we're working on a manufacturing line together and you're screwing in your widget and I'm screwing in my widget. Do you have any reason to know or care about what my background is? I'm there. We're both pulling our $8 an hour job. Does it matter what my history is? Good question. It matters to the employer. I get that. I see that they have a right to know and they can make the decision one way or the other. But this is if after the fact, if in the process of your employment, you disclose the information. If you've lied about it, that's grounds for termination. But should you be fired from the job? Because after the fact, they've hired you, you're doing a good job. Then they decide, oh, this is causing conflict. And now they decide to get rid of you. I'm going to have fun with this one because I'm a consultant and I just consulted with an employer in the last two weeks about this very issue. And as I believe that our audience generally been conservative, most people don't believe on the conservative side of empowering the government to tell the business how to manage its, its internal affairs. 
for, uh, and, and uh, right, to, right to work is the buzzword from union busting and right to work states and employment at will. Right to work and employment at will is the buzz, buzzwords for conservatives. That's their, that's their mantra in terms of employment relations. Employment at will gives an employer the right to terminate anyone for any reason other than something that's prohibited by law. And since being a convicted sex offender is not, as far as I know, in any state, uh, there's no protection for that for that subclass. You can't turn around and say, "Well, the big bad government should come in and protect people from being fired." And you're if you're either for employment at will, or you're for government intervention. But you can't have it both ways. Most states are employment at will if you don't have a collective bargaining union agreement or an individualized contract, you are at the will of the employer and they can terminate you for any reason. So being a sex offender is a reason. Sure. Right? I, I mean, it, it's a thing. I don't know if it's a legit reason, but it's a thing. Well, it's it's for any reason or no reason at all. Right. Having conflict, if the word gets out within an employment setting and people are, are, are it's, it would be really uh, spectacular for the government to say, I don't care if you've got 42 employees that are unhappy. And you've got 17 of those that are ready to quit. We're going to force you to employ this person. That would go contrary to most conservative doctrine, I would think. Right. (laughs) But but, so I would say the answer is absent a collective bargaining agreement through a union with the protections that come with those bargaining agreements in terms of due process after being hired, absent an individual contract and absent a, a federal or state law protecting you, absolutely an employer can fire you. Am I advocating it? No, because I don't want the email that's going to come in. I'm just asking. I'm answering the question. Can they do it? The answer is yes, they can do it. Which almost goes back to the housing problem. Now they've lost that job. It's already hard enough with various uh, work restrictions, distance, proximity kind of things. And it, it's shitty. It's just It's just bad that because – Someone has pink hair, someone, um, I just how they're ugly. I, it just, it seems really crappy that you have someone that is in good standing and they end up getting outed as being on the registry and that you would then turn around and can them. Except for the reasons that it's in your interest to do so. If, if, if the employer knew about it and did not anticipate that there would be this much problem, they may have had their head in the right place, but they can't deal with the turmoil that's ca- causing. And there again, we wouldn't want the big old bad government to come in and force them to uh, to encounter lower productivity and a work slowdown because of forcing them to keep someone on the payroll. Would we? No, absolutely not, because the government should intervene. Private sector knows everything best. That's generally what people of conservative leanings believe. Yes. I don't agree with it, but that's generally where they come from, <laughs> that, that, that the government is the source of the problem. Uh, government staying out of thing is the, generally the solution. I have a question for you. I have no answers tonight. All right. Well, so you're driving down the road and it's getting kind of late. You're, you're, you're getting tired. The sun's down. Your eyes are tired. And you decide to find the next available hotel. Do you think it's important to find out if there are sex offenders living in the hotel? It had never crossed my mind in the, the many hundreds. I don't know how many hundreds, but certainly well over a hundred, maybe multiple hundreds of times. I've never given that a lot of consideration. I don't think people do give that a consideration. I in, in in the numbers of hotels that I've stayed in, the doors are pretty strong. I mean, they're they're pretty solid doors, generally speaking. Go to a lower end hotel; I'm sure it's not quite as solid. But if you're in a halfway decent hotel, it's a pretty solid, impregnable door. Well, not to mention all the vast surveillance apparatus that any type of hotel at the at the roadside level and up, uh, the the branded hotels, the 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 the, the uh, Holiday Inn. The, uh, you name all the the roadside hotels, the Quinta, they have a massive internal surveillance operation going mm-hmm. on these days. So this is from NBC Chicago. What to do to make sure your family doesn't rent a hotel room next to a registered sex offender? I have multiple things to ask about this. Does it matter? Don't rent the hotel room. 
Do you think that someone is going to break t- into your room and abduct your children? I mean, seriously, you're in a hotel. There's a hundred people there. There's 500 people there. Do you just see people running around with kids on tucked under each arm running out of the building? What I, I, I can't figure out what the threat is in this context that this matters. It's the boogeyman, Andy. The, oh. If if people are staying at a hotel, they're on a registry. You know they would be up to no good because why wouldn't they? Why would they stay at the hotel versus going out and finding their own place to stay? Right. Why would they? Why would they stay in a hotel? They probably like that they have room service and uh, maid service. So I don't see how you you don't ever hear a story or any sort of video surveillance footage of some dude walking running out of the hotel with a kid tucked under each arm as he's abducting them to try and make his hasty getaway. How, how does anybody care? I I've never considered, well, I wonder who's staying next door. I wonder if they're a pedo. I, I, it just never even crosses my mind. I've, I've never given that any thought, but it's the fear, Andy, of, 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 I mean, we could spend a whole episode about what's wrong with our media apparatus in this country, and and it would it would it would it would devour the program, probably multiple episodes. But they live and die by ratings. They have to come up with things that make people want to watch and want to listen, and the, 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 this is something that sells. Until it stops selling, the media is not going to stop doing it. So we've got we've got NBC five in Chicago running a story that's creating that no one's ever thought of. Now people are thinking about it now after they've run the story, and they've hit a chord because people there are people out there saying, "Gee, I never thought of that. How safe am I at a hotel?" You almost would have to think that the hotel lobby would be like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! Don't run that story. We don't want that information to go out." I'm quite sure the hotel lobby didn't like that story once once it ran, uh, but the, the 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 repercussions could be enormous. There could be a backlash where, where the where, where hotels feel like they have to do more screening and more exclusions because if, if particularly if if, if uh, Channel Five, uh, NBC Five in Chicago gains traction and they get a lot of positive feedback, they will stay on the story as as long as people are wanting to hear about it. I said a, a couple of few episodes back about why we cover the royal family. It's because people want to hear about it, the royal family. I, I, and, I'm and, looking and at the people, comments on the if website. If people want to hear this story, if people if, if people want to hear this story and it and it and it, and it take it, it has legs, they will stay on it and they will contact hotel industry, tourist industry. They will ask them for their comments and what are they doing to keep families safe. I need to reach out to this. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to tweet to her when uh, we cover this, but so here's a, here's a comment from somebody. These poor reporters, I have to think that many of them actually have brains. So these idiotic stories and reporting must literally eat at their souls. I do feel sorry for them that they have to deal with such stupidity on a daily basis. And it says then that the, uh, and the vast majority of people in the U S are just so incredibly brainless that they eat this stupidity up. I think that's now, who said that. I love that. That's a comment on the article from somebody. And well, there's a couple other uh, ones and they're actually, they're not, they're not telling, they're not in support of the article either. They're telling them that they're stupid for writing an article like this. Well, it's needless, needlessly causing people to have consternation that they would have never thought of. I've never checked into a hotel and thought much about it. the things I, I think about. Don't have anything to do with who's so much inside the room is what's the neighborhood like? What's the security lighting like? How well kept is the facility, which is going to tell me a lot about the management of the hotel. If the exterior lights are half not working and the, the carpeting is falling apart and, and the coffee is a, 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 a black layer in, in the bottom of a pot that hasn't been changed all day. I kind of get a picture about the facility that that doesn't. I don't find it very appealing. Right. And, and, and you you would you would know intuitively that a place like that would probably have some uh, people staying there that you probably wouldn't want to have as your neighbors. So That's you right. get in your car and you leave and you go to a place that, that. But if I'm in a place that I feel comfortable that, that feels warm and inviting, I don't give any consideration to who's there other than there might be a crowd of people there of a, of a group of some kind, which can be a problem because you can have a rowdy group. 
Right. But it's, you know, 12 o'clock at night or it, it, you're tired. You're there to spend the night and, and move on. Or, and, and that's not always the case. That's not why people only stay at hotels, just like the conference coming up in, in whatever, three weeks. Uh, we're there to do our business and, and have our meeting and we're, get, get out. Well, the NBC will have to check their ratings and see how, how, how they're doing if they're trying to pull themselves out of the cellar or what, uh, what, what's going on. And another one from the same state from clicked on Detroit neighbors in Brandon Township worried about safety. It looks like a pretty nice house here, Larry. And it, it, they set up a, somebody set up a group home. I couldn't quite get details out of the article on, on how the house came to be, but a person puts the house on the market and then now there's a whole cavalry of sex offenders living across the street in this nice neighborhood. They should be ashamed of themselves for trying to live in a decent house. That does look like a nice house. That kind of looks like your house. Oh, yeah, totally. We're paying tax dollars <laughs> to live in a safe area, and that's not the case now, says a resident. And, and, and a cavalry of sex offenders. Cavalry. There's two, I think it said. <laughs> Uh, Oakland County and community are, are, are furious after a loophole in state law uh, sex offenders and former criminals to move into an adult group home. I, where are they? They've got to go somewhere. Don't you want to then mold them to what nice people live like that? Like, you know, you see all their cars leaving at six and seven o'clock in the morning to get to their eight o'clock jobs. Isn't that the kind of model that you want them to see what normal and I say that with scare quotes, but isn't that how you want people to live? I'm suspecting there's more to this when it's an adult group home. These are probably people who have various levels of disabilities. Could be. In addition to their, to their, to their, uh, to their criminal history. And then another neighborhood said, a neighbor said, I'm a retired PO. I put people like that in jail. I would never have sold the house to them. Actually, I'm sorry. That's the homeowner that sold the house. Anyway, I just wanted to bring this up as this is just assholery at its finest. Oh, I have no idea where Brandon Township, Michigan is. I swear but. it said no. Okay, I'm sorry. I okay, but I'm seeing I'm, I'm seeing clicked on Detroit. I, I'm, well, I'm, it, it says Oakland County, which is uh, I think is Detroit. That's where Doctor Gavorkian did his uh, uh, he when he when he performed his services, he delivered them to the Oakland County Medical Examiner. Okay. I think so I, I think this may be a may be a su- suburb of uh, of Detroit. Our Michigan p- people can let us know on the podcast uh, how brain dead we are here for not knowing Michigan. <laughs> we, uh, sh- we should get Josh to to chime in. Uh, the, the, it's the only place I ever lived where they had townships where that you would be in a place that would be called such and such. Township. Oh no, Pennsylvania has townships too. Yeah, well, I've never lived there, but I have lived oh. in Michigan, and we we had townships all over the place. Okay. And then moving on from the Collateral Consequences Resource Center, and this is about expungement legislation in Maryland and Oklahoma, where it seems to be mostly on the lower end of offenses, uh, whether that's, you know, writing bad checks or the level drug offenses, mostly misdemeanors that you, I think I read that even in a handful of cases, your expungement proceeds automatically. You don't even have to file for it. And in in Oklahoma, they're reducing it from 15 years down to five, I think it said. Wow. It said that uh, Mary Fallon signed a bill making felony el- uh, offenders eligible for expungement sealing for the first time without requiring that they be pardoned. Right. Effective November 1st, 2018, a person may apply to the court for expungement for a single nonviolent felony conviction five years after completion of the sentence if the person has not been, not been convicted of any other felony or separate misdemeanor in the past seven years. That sounds to me like a red state that is embracing criminal justice reform. It does sound that way. We need to give them a shout out. That is a very good coming from a, from a red state. And Maryland, it sounds of similar, you know, um, situations. And that's a blue state, but it has to be a governor, a Republican governor, Larry okay. Hogan, signed the bill. So I felony offenses involving uh, uh, theft, drug trafficking, and burglary. This list of more than 100 misdemeanors made eligible for expungement. Again, it's all on the lower end of things, but you got to start somewhere. You can't go take, uh, I guess you couldn't have, go after murder and try and do expungement. It's going to be a tougher sell, but that's your best recidivism defense there is. You would think that those could then work past that if that's the, that's the model, right? 
You'd think so. <laughs> but but it looks like this is gaining a little bit of steam because the list of states, according to the Collateral Resource Center, thanks them thank them for their spectacular work in this area. But there's a, a, a number of Indiana, Tennessee states are considering that that are Nebraska, uh, Kansas. All right. So the cynic in me says that they're doing that to free up prison space for to not reduce prison population, but to tack on tougher sentences on the on the high end. I'm not seeing that so much around the country, Andy. The, the, it seems like we've reached the crest. And I mean, I'm seeing it at the federal level. The president ran on the campaign to, yeah. to make the, but I'm not seeing that even in red states. I'm seeing that, that, that there's a move to make sentencing more, more rational. Your state is one of those who's moving, has moved in that direction. And, and our state, unfortunately, under the former prosecutor the last eight years who's holding the, the, the governor's office, uh, we haven't moved in that direction. We've tried, but we we can't get past a, a veto of the of the governor or anything we've tried to do. But I I just I sense that the states are ahead uh, of of the federal system, and 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 it seems to be uh, across the board, both red and blue states, which is a good thing. I I'm going to throw this out there and correct me if I'm misguided. I have heard it said that we have 50 little democracy experiments. And it would almost be like capitalism of whichever one succeeds the best. Well, shoot, the state next door would go, well, that worked there. Then maybe we should adopt it here. That individual states would be the bleeding edge and it would take longer for the Fed to catch up. It seems that, it seems that way that, that, the, that it takes a while for the, for the federal officials to reflect the change. I mean, they, they were kicked and dragging on same-sex marriage. Many states had done it. Uh, it, 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 it's 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 usually, it's usually the states that that, that lead the way, and the, so uh, maybe uh, maybe a better, a, a more tolerable conversation across most people would be about the marijuana legalization. Same thing. The states are leading the way, and yeah. didn't didn't AG Sessions say something to the effect of? Uh, he, he really, he really put some fear into the, to the pot growers like in Colorado and so forth that they really are like quaking in their boots now. He's, he's made it clear that he's not convinced as far as I know that he's holding the line that, that, that we we're, we're not going to ease the federal restrictions as a controlled substance and the states that are doing it uh, need to be considering that there may be adverse consequences to them. We'll, we'll have to wait and see if, it, 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 with public opinion going against the, 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 uh, that it, it's hard to imagine they can maintain that posture. And is this then, I, I've asked you this before about a politician. Do they merely reflect what their constituents want? So they're just, I don't know, call it an ambassador for their constituents, or do they actually have those beliefs inside? It doesn't seem like Jeff Sessions has any any intent he's had that position for whatever he's 70 years old or whatever he is he's held that position his entire life that even if society moved in that direction i don't think he would then support it he would just not uh attack it and try and tear it down well in the case of that question it's both some politicians will will are willing to surrender their their political career to do what they really strongly believe in and if it costs them their offices they'll so be it but more often, it's a reflection. You are being elected to, to represent a group of people, whether it be governor representing all the people of the state, whether it be a state senate district or, or U.S. senate seat where you're representing an entire state or a congressional district, which is a portion of a state or any number of offices. You are. It's kind of it's kind of unreasonable to, to think that the, that the people that you're looking to represent should just stand there and flip the middle finger and say, I'm going to do what the heck I want to do. I don't care what you people think. Right. How would that be representation? And I guess in Sessions' case, he's not representing anybody. He's at the uh, direction of the president. He is at the pleasure of the president. The president would determine if, if he accurately represents the view of the administration. The president, this president, does not have a total connection with, with his people. Will, his supporters will support him because of issues that they disagree with, but they like the way he talks yeah. and they like certain things about what he says. So he can overcome a lot of opposition where people say, well, nope, I don't agree with, I don't agree with that. Don't agree with that. 
but I'm still for him. Right. Because he's kicking ass. He's doing this. He's, uh, and they'll, they'll latch onto one or two key issues. And, and that, that, uh, 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 means that, that he, he doesn't have to be with them. I think when you and I, Josh, were talking last week, to me, the most important thing for a registered citizen would be their personal safety and to be able to mix with their children and raise them and mm-hmm. go to school plays and go to the PTA and have a job and rent a house. To me, that would be a lot more important than Saddam Hussein maybe might come get us someday, even though he's dead. I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to me, all that stuff would be more important than a border wall. Agreed. But 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 that's not the way Trump supporters see it. They will latch on to a few issues and they'll say he's with us on this. He's with us on that. And I don't care about that. My point is on the marijuana. I don't think. First of all, I'm not sure where the president is on that because I've heard conflicting messages. But even if he were to endorse a crackdown on states who have legalized marijuana, I don't think his I don't think he would be penalized by it because marijuana is not the most important thing to his his base. That's right. not what they view as the number one issue. I don't disagree with your assessment there at all. Ready to be a part of Registry Matters? Get links at registrymatters.co. If you need to be all discreet about it, contact them by email, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. You can call or text a ransom message to 747-227-4477. Want to support Registry Matters on a monthly basis? Head to patreon.com slash registrymatters. Not ready to become a patron? Give a five-star review at Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Or tell your buddies at your treatment class about the podcast. We want to send out a big heartfelt support for those on the registry. Keep fighting. Without you, we can't succeed. You make it possible. I love this article, Larry. This comes from the LA Times, and its eyewitness testimony is often unreliable, and police and lawmakers know it. I love this article. And then talking about, they're, they're talking about scientific principles of using double blind procedures to have witnesses, uh, have like lineups. I forget the right terms where, uh, they put the six people there behind the two way mirror or one way mirror. Um, and some, some clips in the articles is people are sent away for crimes they did not commit based on testimony from eyewitnesses who were either pressured or gently led into falsely identifying a suspect. I remember. I don't know, five or six years ago, I heard a segment on NPR where they were talking about this subject and the subtlety of an officer leading a, an eyewitness into that little booth. And they're just these little gestures. Are you sure it's not that one? You know, number three, are you positive? And they totally just in, in even in non-communication ways, nonverbal, they, they, they lead the witness to, uh, to, to claim that number three did the deed and they may even have six guys there that, or six gals, they might even have six people there that had nothing to do with the crime. But now the guy has led them. The uh, police officer has led the witness to, to, to point somebody out. It's even, it's even scarier than that because the, the oftentimes if you do a lineup, there's there's not a lot of people hanging around police stations ready to do a lineup at the, at the behest of the police. So who who do you think stands in the lineup when they're doing these? Do you think it's a do they think they go up and round up a bunch of criminals and or how, who do you think? Oftentimes it's 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 cops that stand in the lineup. Well, I've actually never considered where they got the other five people. And, and, and when you're looking at the cop, with rare exceptions for those who are old enough to remember the movie Serpico, very few cops look like Serpico did. All right. <laughs> Did you see the movie Serpico? I thought I did. Yeah, well, he grew his hair long, and he he was an undercover detective. But but the, when you're using when you're using people who don't look like quote criminals, right. they're going to zero in on the per- so if the if the if 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 a person who has a criminal history is hauled in, particularly if they snatch them off the street for some misbehavior, and Take them in and put them into a lineup. The most, uh, the 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 one that's the least well attired yeah. is what the average person's going to focus on. Who well, has that besheveled look and hasn't shaved for three days? And, and uh, yeah, that kind of looks like him. Can be a can be can be can be a possibility. <laughs> the, the eyewitness identification. There's so much evidence of their unreliability. 
that I'm surprised that jurors even consider it very much anymore because it's 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 so well known that that people can't remember what they saw five minutes ago with accuracy. That's what we have talked about on a number of occasions of 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 eyewitnesses and how unreliable they were. I think it was two or three podcasts. I went on a little rant about it, but we we have discussed many times of the the. The witnesses are so revered in the courtroom, like, oh, my God, here's this little old lady, and she said she saw the guy. And people are like, oh, my God, there's no reason why she would ever lie. We think that our memory and our our visual, our our senses are just infallible, and they are ridiculously fallible. They are are indeed, and I'll be the first to attest to my lack of – you would not want me as an eyewitness. I, I, I see very little. I mean, I have good vision. I, I can see 2020, but I see very little in terms of my surroundings. Okay. I'm focused on other things other than what color shirt you're right. wearing and whether you have on a nice watch and whether you have a freckle or anything like that or what color that hat is. I, I'm not focused on that. And, and uh, you asked me, what did he look like? Yeah. He, it, it was a, it was a male. Yeah. What was he wearing? I don't right. know. How tall was he? He was about average height. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I would be a horrible witness if, 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 you, if you tried to pin me down as an eyewitness. If I wasn't prepared for it and something happened quickly, I would, I would, I would not be able to articulate back what happened. So two bills mandating such procedures were sent to Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who promptly vetoed them. In the midst of a budget meltdown, the governor said that imposing new requirements on local law enforcement agencies was too expensive because of the cost of video equipment and storage. And because the police might have to hire non-officer administrators to conduct the double blind procedures, later bills never even made it out of committee. We're talking about people's liberties. And as you said in the last podcast, that our founding fathers wanted to make it crazy difficult for your liberties to be taken away. I did say that. And I, I'm inclined uh, to agree with you, but here it is where bills I, – I, I'm just going to assume a bill has made it through both sides of the house except for whatever, N- Nebraska, where there's one. So they got an, a, a majority of legislators to agree on a thing, and they sent it to the governor, and he said no. Well, this would have to be an old story because Schwarzenegger hasn't been governor for some time. Yeah, and then they – but uh, I, the uh, article itself isn't old. Uh, they're just bringing that up about the, uh, the, okay. the procedures of using double blind studies where you take the officer that's doing the lineup, the checking. He is not involved in the case at all. Doesn't know anything about it. Doesn't know the witness. Doesn't know any of the perps in the lineup. So he's just like, Hey, is it number one, two, three, four, five, six? I don't care. I don't know anything about it. That's how a double blind well, study would work. Well, the, uh, the point, point would be that the legislature has had a, 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 a realization and then that the, 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 the governor at that time didn't agree, but do you think he's got his advice from from what I call the police, the law enforcement apparatus, or do you think he got his advice from the American Civil Liberties Union on the veto? Oh, I can pretty much guarantee you that he got it from the law enforcement people. And he he issued a veto. Okay, since Jerry Brown's been governor, what have they done to try to reenact that legislation to see if Brown will accept it? That would be a good question. And it says it's now time for California to do what it should have done in 2008, require police agencies to abide by a set of standards to protect lineup, photo identification, and other white eyewitness procedures from improper influence. Those overdue mandates are now set forth in Senate Bill 923, authored by Senator Scott Werner or Wiener and um, Assemblyman Mark Levin. Uh oh, watch out! <laughs> Not your Mark Levin, Larry. Both, Not your Mark Levin. These are these are both liberal do-good Democrats. Uh, Wiener from San Francisco, and uh, 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 um, Levine from San Rafael. And it says lawmakers should should quickly send the bill to Governor J- uh, Jerry Brown, who will who who should sign it. Well, we'll see. Right. Uh, but I can assure you the law enforcement people are not for this because it's going to be more costly, more difficult. And justice, justice does have a call. I get it. I, I'm just struggling with if their mandate is to serve and protect, that doesn't mean rake people over the coals, harass people. I'm not saying that, that like 1% of the law enforcement app to me, I, I, the majority of them are doing the right honorable job. But it's easy for them to influence and be lazy one day, perhaps, and 
and they don't want to fill out the paperwork or something. And they, you know, I just, they're supposed to do the right thing. We've put those, those people in those positions to do the right thing, the honorable thing with integrity and honesty. And many of them do do the right thing with integrity and honesty, uh, uh, but they're human and, and uh, they, they, they take shortcuts. And, and there's this thing as the gut instinct. And people believe that they've got the right person. And by golly, this is all just a bunch of red tape and hoopla they're putting me through. I've got my guy. That's what the people up in Boulder Police Department thought with the Ramses. They had the, they had the right. They didn't need to be out looking for 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 Dominic's killer. They had him right there before them, or so they thought. Yeah. Until years later, they were exonerated. <laughs> I don't know, man. It just feels it feels that if they if they are wrong, there are significantly greater consequences for. Our side of the equation, not not us as registrants or or con- convicted felons, but just our side as the civilians, that they have the resources, the guns, and to to make your life very very difficult, to, including just at the low end of embarrassing you in front of your neighbors and making a talk and like, oh my god, what did that person do? All the way to the point of putting you on a lineup and then your picture ends up in the paper and your TV and you end up on TV. All for an accusation because somebody misidentified you and they have all those resources. They should err on the side of caution, way more on the side of caution. And and our elected officials have to start hearing that from us. Oh, it's back to us. That it's back to us. So when, elections have well, consequences. Like, well, we, we, we have a sheriff election coming up here in my county, most uh, many counties across the country. In 2018, you'll be electing a lot of sheriffs around the country. Okay. And when your sheriff is running – when you tell those candidates, our sheriff is dead set against uh, body cams, and I disagree with our sheriff on that. I have I have full support of body cams, but there are some issues related to the body cams in terms of when they should be. Uh, there's there's there are moments where officers can encounter you where you would have an expectation of a little bit more privacy, Fair. and there are things that you would not want put on uh, available if if these are public information, which they are. If you can go down and buy the footage. And retrieve it. Then we have to have some controls. But the law enforcement would be better protected if the officers were using them. Our sheriff needs to be hearing that. The current sheriff, who's against it, he needs to be hearing that. That we disagree with you, sir. We think officers, for their own protection as well as us as citizens, should have these this technology. It's low cost, and and it, there, there's more good that comes from bad. But our sheriff isn't hearing that, apparently. Right. And, and that's what needs to be happening on this legislation. Governor Brown, if this gets to his desk, he needs to be hearing from – he needs to get a bill that's almost unanimously passed with bipartisan support to the extent that there is bipartisanship. California Assembly is overwhelmingly Democratic. But to the extent that there are Republicans, there are probably a third of them Republicans. They need to be bipartisan, and we need to convey to Governor Brown this is important. This is what the people want. Right. And if Governor Brown hears that message loud and clear, it may take it, – it may be that it doesn't meet with the same thing that Schwarzenegger did with, with the veto. He may say, law enforcement, I'm sorry, but this is this is sound public policy. I will sign it. Right. Here's a quick little update from the Miami Herald. Homeless sex offenders lose court fight to keep highly a tent camp. Where to next? Our next article is going to be a fun one. Uh, but this one – so here you got 270-something people. Uh, but the Miami Dade judge on Thursday cleared away for the county to dismantle a tent village of homeless sex offenders outside Hialeah. And a li- lawyer for some of the residents said the ruling leaves them no choice but to live on a roadside or a street somewhere else. I, I know we were talking about this just a little while ago. And then also, I don't know, sometime last week, I think it was in Argentina that the building burned down, the homeless building where they were squatting. Was that? Yes, yes, it was uh, in Brazil. Brazil. Uh, and, and you were just talking about maybe substandard living conditions and what are you supposed to do? Would you rather live in substandard living conditions or would you rather live out in the elements? I think I would take a substandard um, building versus on the street. Uh, obviously not an ideal uh, an ideal situation. And even Josh said uh, last week, he said, <laughs> I can't believe I'm sitting here rooting for them to keep their tent city. This is just sad. 
It's tragic, tragic. They have to live 2,500 feet away from schools and all those other places. That, that, that has to make that county just about unlivable. Ridiculous since that's one of the most urban places in Florida. Mm. It's Miami Dade County. Yeah. That's where Hurricane Andrew like rolled right through, right? I believe what? That was back in 92, yeah. I think. Uh, so yeah, so it's very flat. It's, it's a, it's a well populated area. I, what are they supposed to do? Larry, if, if someone called you and they were describing their situation, do you have any suggestions? Well, the only suggestion I can make is that to the extent possible, get out of Miami Dade County and try to find a place where the residency buffers are much shorter, much smaller. I think it's, it also and, says in there, so the, the normal, the, the minimum in Florida is a thousand feet. Thousand. That's the state rule. Is yeah. a Florida action committee. I mean, how, how much involvement do you think they have in this? I know that it's a high priority issue for them with their limitations on resources yeah. that they have, but it, it, that re- residency restrictions are, are, are really tragic because those people that were I mean, they've been moved out from under the Julia Tuttle, Julia Tuttle Causeway some years ago, and they they they're they're like nomads uh, looking for a place to pitch a tent. Right, right. And we and we and we talk about what compassionate Americans we are. And I would urge the people in Florida and living in Dade County to take a look at yourself and ask yourself, really? Yeah. Am am I really the compassionate person that I say I right. am? These people have paid their debt to society. And they're trying to reestablish their lives. And if you if you believe what you say you do, you can't be comfortable with what's happening to your fellow human beings. You know, you said something uh, talking about, I don't know if it was last one or two weeks ago, if you were somehow banished from going to the state capitol to support or oppose legislation, I, I, you said something to the effect of, I dare you to try and stop me. I would I would disregard that without any hesitation. This next article, one of, this, one, one of the fundamental rights you have is to petition government for redress of your grievances, and I would absolutely disregard that. This next article then comes from NBCWashington.com. So this is in the D.C. area. Sex offender kicked out of a meeting sued Stafford County School Board. He was he was going to a school board meeting at a school as a registered sex offender because there were some disciplinary issues that he was having a problem with. And he's a member of the NAACP. And as he's trying to go into the school, a, uh, a County police officer escorted him out. I, I think that he's going to have a potential for an action there. These, these are public meetings. But if you're prohibited from going to schools, parks, daycares, blah, 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 doesn't that prevent you from doing something related, uh, ancillary, oh, I can't say that word, ancillary related to school? I mean, he's there for a disciplinary issue relating to the school, but it's not during school hours. It's not during uh, a school game or anything like that. It would be, it would be where, where I think that there would be a good cause of action for, for, for him. That is a, an elected body and they're conducting official business and to make that, to conduct business in a place where the citizens don't have access to for whatever the reasons is extremely pro- problematic. Um, I, I would, I would, I would definitely seek a legal representation. I hate to say contact the ACLU because I don't know that they would take it, but I would definitely contact. Well, I mean, uh, attorneys and see and see if they can find some way to represent. He's an African American. I, I gotta think that the NAACP would stand. I, I, it feels like that would be something that they would stand up if a black guy is getting kicked out of a school trying to exercise his First Amendment rights. I think that they would jump. Somebody would jump in. I'm not so sure the ACLU would see it. I mean, the NAACP would see it as a racial issue. He wasn't getting kicked out because of his race. They would jump on it then, but he was getting kicked out because he's on the register. True. Right? Yep, yep, yep. Um, but but uh, where is this Stafford County at? Where, I can't where, speak where to where it is. I just know that it's coming from the D.C. area. I'm not familiar with it. It could be on the Virginia side. I'm from that area. I, the, the county name doesn't ring a bell for me. It is well, a, a Stafford me. County, Virginia. Uh, I, 
uh, well, the person, the person, I know he's listening to the podcast, so he should call us and talk about okay. it. Okay. What was that number again? 747 227 4477. How'd you like that, man? Just rolls off the tongue. We'll, we'll, we will seek to find you representation if you're listening to our podcast. Excellent. Oh, you think Narsal would step up? I don't know that Narsal would, but, I, but me personally, I would okay. seek to try to find him a representation for, for this. I, I can't speak for Narsal because we, we collectively make decisions individually. Uh, no one has the authority to make this, but it was, it would be well received by Narsal, I can tell he, you. Yeah, uh, he does have representation and the attorney said, you have a, re- you have a registered sex offender who has totally changed his life around. For him to have his freedom of speech chilled, that's a big deal. His crime was in 04, so it's been 14-ish years since his crime. Uh, took place. He served 30 days in oh, jail for, soli- for indecent, indecent liberties with children in an online chat room 14 years ago. So he does have representation. He is going to seek legal redress. Yes. That's yeah. good. Maxwell Sokol is the name of the attorney. That's, that's, that's good to know. And, but the, so help me, help me decipher this. It says that's an incorrect reading of the statute. The statute prohibits him from being on a school campus. But if the school is hosting something that is not, not during school hours, does the school campus moniker change? Well, ultimately that would be a, a judicial interpretation of, of, of that. He's got a compelling argument that uh, that it's not it's not serving that purpose as a school at that time. It is a campus, but it's not it's not being used as a school at that time. Right. Uh, I, I, this will be a good appellate issue depending on how the lower court rules, and, and it would be an issue that Norris will be interested in. Now that I know he has an attorney, that's what I was trying to look up when I kind of lost you. I, and our final, and uh, I guess this would be our topic of the night, would be this this uh, interview that was done between Ron Book and the ACLU attorney down in Florida talking about the homeless guys that we just talked about a couple episodes ago. And I just got to start. This guy is so angry. Well, let's, uh, let's tell people who Ron Book is for the people who are not listening. He is the, uh, he's the director chairman of the uh, Miami-Dade County Homeless Trust. His, his uh, responsibility is to get people off the streets and into housing. He's the person who would be theoretically charged with finding housing for these people who don't have a place and have tents. Isn't that giving him a lot more credit? Isn't that being very generous with who he is? Well, that's his official role. Well, he is, he is, he is, he is the executive director of the Miami-Dade County Homeless Trust. It just feels like that's giving him a very generous title for him being a complete, uh, uh, somebody told me tonight, douche. For the people that don't know who he is, so it helps give them some uh, relationship to who we're talking about. If you say Ron Book and nobody's ever heard of him, so well, that's who Ron Book is. All right, let me try this again. Okay, well, let me ask Ron Book about those resident restrictions because you were uh, in, uh, uh, very influential in, in coming up with those restrictions where they cannot be, what, the... Uh, a thousand Within feet 20, away. 2,500 feet of schools, parks, playgrounds, and places where children generally congregate. What what a novel thing to do okay, wait a to minute. keep convicted sexual predators. We have a map. Have committed, we have a, ma- a map, uh, Ron, that mm-hmm. shows where they cannot be, and that really excludes a lot of money. They y- can- you watch the video. He's almost turning red. He is so angry during this whole segment. He definitely sounded and appeared that way to me. <laughs> Here we go. Honey, where are they supposed to go? Well, let me answer my question right. completely because you asked a question. People convicted of sexually deviant behaviors. So tell me what sexually deviant behaviors could, could range from. Well, but he's saying that he's, he's implying that everything that, that's got purple in the registry is something grotesque and deviant, like sexual abuse of a child. But unfortunately, he's... He's just deliberately misleading people. There's there's so many things that you can be on the registry for, particularly in states like Florida that has an expansive list. Uh, so he's he's misleading the people. But the people that, that they are not uh, familiar with the issue would the average person would think that you would have to have done done something really deviant to be on the registry. You snatch some little cute little kid off of a school bus and you've got her held captive in your basement. That would be the impression that, it, that the average. I mean, you and I did an interview on a on a conference call where where a person 
made it clear that her son was not a sexual offender, and and uh, and I said, well, he's got convicted. Of, he's convicted of a sex offense. And she said, well, a sexual offender who's done something, and she described something much more serious than what the average uh, of the sex offense, the people that are out on the public, or the people in the community, well, oftentimes those are the lower level offenses because people have done all those heinous things. They're still serving long prison sentences. And even in some cases, they're serving long prison sentences when they didn't do anything heinous, right. like viewing, viewing underage porn. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would, would put you in prison in most states and in the federal system for a long time. So those people are not out. The people who are likely to be out in the community have actually done the more moderate, lower level offenses. That's the funny thing about right. it. Right. If they had done something more heinous, they would have a, a boatload of time. I almost said something profane, but they would, they would be sitting in prison for 20, 30 something years. Well, yeah, like the people like, uh, like Mr. Sandusky. Right. He was a true sexual predator. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, uh, former House Speaker Hastert also, by his own admission, was a sexual predator. He was not able to be prosecuted, but he 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 did predation for many years when he coached the wrestling team. Those people those people typically don't get out of prison. The gymnast coach, uh, I can't Larry think Nassar, the moment in Michigan, Nassar, he'll never get out of prison. Definitely not. The judge told him. Well, so the true sexual predators were not out in the community. So Mr. Book calls people sexual predators. But there are very few of those actually in the population that are on the registry. And, and Book knows better than that. He's doing that because he can. Do you think he knows it seriously? Do you think that he and also the um, Marcy Hamilton, do you think that they are – are they living in some sort of parallel universe where they, they do believe inside that the recidivism rate, you know, 90% go unreported and the recidivism rate is through the roof. It's just unreported. That's why we're able to report these 3% recidivism rate numbers. I don't, I don't, I don't think he actually, of course, no one knows what's in his head, but I don't know how you could actually believe that. That's like, like asking the, the executives of the tobacco companies, Philip Morris and Williamson and, and uh, 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 RJ Reynolds and all those people, if, if they, if they truly believed that their products weren't harmful when they were saying that, do you think that they actually did believe that their products were not harmful? I, I, I shudder to think that they, they, they didn't know if they didn't know them, then there's something else drastically wrong. But if you, you know what the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. And if we twist that ever so slightly, if you surround yourself with enough information that says that sex offenders are unreported our sexual offenses are unreported. You could eventually internalize that, and then you just discard all of the el- everything else. It is the inverse of fake news. The inverse of fake and, news. I don't think I've heard that term before. I just made it up. I mean, he he is he is personally digesting his own reality of fake news, and he believes that it's true. I guess it actually is fake news, not the inverse of it. He has created this alternate reality where the stuff is true, and then he actually believes it and drives that bus along those uh, along that bus line. Well, he would have to 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 truly believe what he's saying. He would have to have totally tuned out everything. And, and like I was making a comparison with the, the tobacco executives, when Surgeon General is, issued his report in 1964, they they had that information. Uh, they 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 were in de- they had to be in denial or deliberately misleading. They knew that it, scientific evidence had shown there was a direct correlation between tobacco use and severe health uh, side effects. Uh, and and they, they couldn't, with a straight face, tell you that we don't believe our product is harmful. They can tell you with a straight face that we believe our product is a, uh, should be left up to the individual choice right. for the person to do this and. The information's there, and if they choose to do it, that's fine. But for them to say that there's no direct – they've maintained until this tobacco settlement in the 90s yeah. that there was no link between the, the side effects until they finally were, were, were driven to submission by what was going to be awarded by runaway juries. If, if these cases had gone to trial, there was like dozens and hundreds of them that were working the way to the, – the, and their, their uh, attorneys could not keep them. Shield them indefinitely. They were already they were already suffering some high dollar awards, yes. and that's why they entered into the settlement with the state. Money that's been paid out over 25, 30 year period for for the harmful health effects of what the states had paid out to care for what the, they couldn't have they couldn't have not believed. I don't know how Ron Book, who is supposed to be an educated man, could believe that 
the people out on the registry have all done predatory behavior. He couldn't believe that. All you have to do is look at the list of what's on the sex offense, of what will get you on the sex offender registry. You look at the list, it would take you five minutes to look at all the list of the offenses, and you couldn't believe all those are predatory offenses. Could you? I, I may, maybe if you if you just see sex offender, you just think child molester, and, and that's that's as far as you get, and everything else shuts down. I don't know. I don't see how you could. I don't see how you can get it's, there unless you just. I, I mean, he's he's terribly guilt ridden, and here I am doing some armchair psychology here. But he just he's just angry, and and perhaps it's because he feels all this guilt because his daughter was a victim some dozen twenty years ago. Well, that's a possibility, but I tend to when people when people that are uh, educated don't know any better, I tend to not give them the benefit of the doubt when they I I think they know when they're choosing to I think he's choosing to do what he's doing. Well, let's keep going. And he com- he comes across as a mean. Oh, person he's to horrible. Me. But let's go. Ought not live in close proximity to where children are on a regular basis. That's first of all. Second of all, you can show me this concocted map that the American Civil Liberties Union, the far left thinking individuals. <laughs> I can't. I, every time I hear it, the far left thinking individuals about this map, it's so funny. He kills me. Well, that is. That is what the average American thinks of the American Civil Liberties Union as a far left he, group. But go just, ahead. It's almost like there's spittle coming out of his mouth as he's saying it. Who think that criminals should come out of prison, especially those who offend against children. Which not everybody in prison for a sexual offense offended against a child. And be restored to their normal rights, not have a registry, not have any restrictions. At the end of the day, we have a map. And our map shows where thousands, thousands of predators and offenders that are on the register live in Miami-Dade County. And just two nights ago, when we held our last meeting out there at 71st. Larry, he is so angry. He can't even formulate a full sentence without, like, breaking up his words. He's so angry. 36th Avenue. And by the way, we didn't need to hold one. We've held close to a dozen of them out there where we bring not only our housing navigators and our career source folks to help get them places to live and provide the financial resources for it. We had one individual who brought 15 addresses the other night, much to the chagrin and disappointment of the ACLU and, and legal services. We would be six delighted of which, if there were six places of which, for our clients six of to which live. were Jeez. solid, good addresses, and they went re- in. They to- so the person brought 15 addresses, but only six of them were solid. And solid means that they were acceptable for the within the boundaries of the restrictions. I guess. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's what it means. So out of 275 people in the tent city, they have found places for six people to live. Well, that's a start. Oh, it's, certainly. Six people is better than zero, but you still have, what, 269 people. Uh, I think it's 277. So now there's 271 or something like that. So it's 270-something people are still left in a homeless capacity. Well, now they've been evicted from that 71st mm-hmm. and whatever he said address. Yeah. And uh, so now the uh, the ACLU attorney is about to get in. They don't want this. them to be housed. They want them to continue true. to sit out there in a martyr-like approach that is to this completely issue. completely untrue. We want our clients to be housed. There is not sufficient affordable housing in Miami-Dade County for the, there are 455. Would you want them to live in your neighborhood? I'd be happy <laughs> for anyone who has. So Ron Book just, just like snookered at her after the, uh, the TV show host asked her if she would want them to live in her neighborhood. And he's just like, ha! Well, you don't get to have control over who lives in your neighborhood. I used to, when I was in property management, I would tell people who didn't like a particular neighbor, whether it be upstairs or downstairs or beside them, I would tell them, I tell you what you can do. You can rent that apartment and we'll keep it vacant. <laughs> and I never, I never got any uh, uh, acceptance on that offer, but 
You don't really get to choose your neighbors. Oh, that's interesting. And we've also discussed you don't have a right to know who they are either. Well, uh, but the, but choosing your neighbors, I mean, if you believe in the freedoms that you claim you do and what's great about America, why would you want to try to stop someone from having the freedom to buy or rent a place? They make me feel How oogie. Can you justify that. They make me feel and creepy. And square that with with America, basic American values. How can you do that? Let's hear what the attorney says. Done his or her time in prison and is now on probation or finished with probation. There is excellent treatment for ex-sex offenders. uh, And the data is very, very clear that there is no relationship between proximity to schools and offending. And in fact, 95% of sex offenses occur within the home. That's a joke. Of a number, that because is, what you, you want are, people Mr. to believe, Cook, you want people. Me, you interrupted you me. <laughs> it's like in grade school. She did it to me first. <laughs> this kills me, Larry. Okay. And you want people to believe that there are low recidivism rates, and you ignore the fact that ninety percent is housing. underreporting. And Let there are in, Let's talk about housing. Let me bring in the homeless trust because you're also involved mm-hmm. in that. Residents of Miami-Dade County pay a tax. When they get their property tax bill, I get it, we all get it, and we pay a tax to the homeless trust to help in situations yes, like that. but they do not The help. homeless trust, with Ron Book, who has had meetings there, has stepped in and said that they would help these people yes. find homes. And Why they, not let that process take its course? We have, and they've been out there twice, as Mr. Book said, and, in fact, our information is that of the, there are 277 people who have residences at that particular encampment. There are 455 total who have transient residences, and we understand Mr. Book has found housing for six of them. 475, did she say? Well, total, total with transitory addresses, so that would include people that are living in other transit locations other than that particular camp. And, and this homeless trust that collects taxes in the city has found homes for six people. So what else are they doing with the money that they collect with the, the, the beverage tax? Well, I would, I would, I would caution to, to that the, the need, the need would probably far exceed the revenue that they have. Having said that, uh, the, the, uh, the, I doubt they prioritize the people that are on the registry as far as finding them places because of the difficulty you're starting with your hands tied behind your head, assuming that you even had the best of intentions, which I'm not going to say that I think Mr. Book does. But you would be starting with your hands behind your head uh, back because of the uh, the limitations of the 2,500 feet. If you're dealing with a person who doesn't have that restriction, you'd have a lot more opportunity to house them with far fewer restrictions. So it would be a more difficult population to work with, if, even if you were trying. Yeah. And that's great. And we are delighted that six people can have Out of shelter. How many? There are 277 registered at that particular encampment at the edge of Hialeah, and there are 455 registered transients in the Ron, county. Uh, uh, Elliot, six out of as, usual, as usual, Ms. Baker and the American Civil Liberties Union uses distorted, misleading, and inaccurate numbers. First of all, what I said was just Monday night, one person brought six addresses. We have relocated many to other communities at our expense. Here's here's what I, I seriously think is going on. This guy is a powerful individual. He has political connections. This is just my sense and, and help me help me fill in any gaps. This guy has used his political connections to create some sort of pseudo nonprofit that has then levied a tax and they are using that infrastructure to ship the undesirables out of his community. Good. Well, part of what you say is clearly true. He's politically connected. His daughter, I think, is a she senator is. or a representative, and he he uh, he's definitely has influence by his, by the admission of the of the interview that he helped facilitate the twenty five hundred feet restriction in Miami Dade County, and and using all of that uh, to effectively make a banishment. And now he has tax dollars coming in to help ship them out of his town. He did say that. So we're, we're just taking what he, he said that we've moved them to other communities. Now he could be other communities within Miami Dade County, but it certainly sounded like outside of Miami Dade County, which would, that would be a form of uh greyhound therapy as it used okay, to be called fair. when you shipped your people out to other communities. I've heard that term before. 
And we have found housing for a number of them. So that's first of all. Second of all, let me just without disrespectfully correct one thing that you said. When you get your ad valorem tax bill, there is no line on that tax bill for the homeless trust. There are no ad valorem taxes that go to fund the homeless trust or the domestic violence oversight board. We are funded largely with a food and beverage tax that's levied in our community that provides funding both for the homeless trust and the domestic violence oversight board. This Mr. notion, Bolt believes that this, this the, notion, those who are ex-sex offenders that, should not notion, get his services. With, with all due respect, no sex, none of those offenders that have committed acts against children can be cured. No, no expert, untrue. no expert will walk into well, a court of law. He has just live, stated right? a completely. I have heard uh, Emily Horowitz state that exact thing, though, that they can be treated and treatment works. So he just stated that no expert and she's a psychologist. Forgive me, Emily. I don't know your exact title, but she's a professor at a college of and criminal justice kind of subjects. And she has made that statement that you can be treated and that it works. Well, I think I've heard that there's a certain segment of the, of the, of the, of the population where it's difficult if almost impossible to, to treat, but that's assuming that's assuming that everybody needs treatment that's on the registry. Right. And if you start, if you start at the, at the things that can get you on the registry, does a 17 year old that had sex with a 15 year old need treatment? Right. Is there anything to cure there? I, I, it doesn't seem like there's anything wrong. Uh, is there, is there anything to cure with a 19 year old that has sex with a 17 year old? Is there anything that needs to be treated? It doesn't seem like it. Is there anything that needs to be treated about a person who went out streaking? Maybe some counseling, mild counseling about uh, about go, going out and, and doing a decent exposure. But those type of things could easily be treatable. That, uh, what about when there's an impulse control issue? A lot of offenses happen because of maturing adolescent who has proximity to a relative and, and a familiar get together, and there's a lack of impulse control and there's a inappropriate touching. There was there was a there was a temporary aberrational behavior of an otherwise, otherwise law abiding citizen. Is there anything there that needs long term treatment that can't be cured? Uh, to to hear Ron Buck, all those people are uh, he's assuming that they all need treatment and that none of the treatments would work for even for the person who had the impulse control issue. Right. The serial predator probably can't be cured. I doubt Sandusky could be cured. Old age will cure him because he'll get to the point where he can't do it anymore. But I doubt with someone who had been going that many years for that long, it'd be probably most difficult and not impossible. But he's a very rare, minuscule uh, part of that of that population that Mr. Book is talking about. And the about. DSM addresses that particular kind of person you just described. And that is literally what the term pedophile is, is someone that's attracted to young children. But even even being a pedophile doesn't mean that you are going to act upon it. Now you've moved into some sort of sociopathic kind of – uh, you know, b- behavior to, to couple the two together that turns you in. That, that's got to be a ridiculously small number of people in the population. It is. And even those on the registry streaking, you didn't report your kids having sex, all that stuff, all those things he then says are not treatable. And perhaps he's right because there's nothing to treat. <laughs> we should send him a letter and say, you're right. Some of these things that put people in registry are not treatable because there's nothing there. There's no illness to treat. Right. We just got a couple seconds left of this uh, new segment. Housing that is available in our community, it's out there and it's available. It and like not. I said, and by the way, Elliot, we have provided your staff, your reporters that had been out at the site as recently as Monday okay. night. They were given the map to show where thousands of them live in this community. Uh, we're going to keep following the this story and there's a lawsuit. And this- mm-hmm. He's so angry. There are thousands, thousands, Larry. Well, there probably are. Yes, I'm sure there are. a number of people living in in there. But that doesn't change the reality of the situation. No, it does not. So I, I did find a quote that I liked this week, and it is, You can't always choose the path you walk in life, but you can always choose the manner in which you walk it. That is from John O'Leary. I thought that uh, seemed relevant to the fight that we are in. 
And who the heck is John O'Leary? I, Didn't he die back 123 years I ago? I am sure this is a is a is an old quote. Uh, I just get emails and so forth of motivational quotes, and this one seemed fitting and also related to let's our see, fight. Let's see if he died 123 years ago. Let's see if you two went to school together. That's the question. <laughs> As always, Larry, I, I, I want to thank you. I may be a little bit older than him. Uh, that's possible. I want to thank you so much for joining us. And another thing, if you need to subscribe to get notifications of it, visit registrymatters.co. You can follow us on uh, on Twitter, not on Facebook because of their silly policies. Um, where else? Dial in 747-227-4477, registrymatterscast at gmail.com. I think that covers everything. That will uh, end the show, and I appreciate Larry, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Andy. Bye.